Right, the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 5. And I want to begin reading. Well, we'll just read the whole chapter, if that's all right. We won't be long tonight. Let's start in verse 1, and we'll read down to the end of verse, uh, there in verse 14. Where the Bible says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, and he will appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye, uh, ha ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Slavanius, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with the kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, we want to ask you one more time to have your will in your way. Thank you for the souls that you've saved in this place. And Lord, whatever you're pleased to do tonight, Lord, we'll praise you for it. Touch your unprofitable servant, Lord, that I may be able to preach. Uh, Lord, not for a man's glory or the parading of flesh, but Lord, give us unction, please, tonight, so that we're able to have clarity of the Scriptures. Holy Ghost, if you would please be the real preacher and preach to the hearts uh, of these individuals. And Lord, whatever's done that's good in this place, Lord, we'll tell everybody that you've done it. And Lord, we'll praise you for all the good things that come out of this service. Thank you for everything. Most of all, thank you for Jesus and it's in that name that we ask these things. Amen. Uh, the first letter of Peter is written according to chapter 1 of 1 Peter in verse 1 to scattered saints. It's a letter that is written to saints. All of these chapters of the first letter or the first book of Peter is written according to verse 1 in chapter 1 to the strangers that are scattered abroad. The historians will tell you that writings of Peter began when persecution 
begin to be coming on the rise around 64, 67 A.D., uh, the Christians in the era there, the followers of Christ, begin to take on heavy persecution. They begin to become martyrs for the sake of the faith. Uh, uh, this is a crucial time because many people at this time were beginning to fade off the scene. They begin to go into hiding, if you will. They were hiding for their lives. And the apostle Peter had the privilege of writing to these suffering saints. Tonight we know that uh, sufferings come. Uh, there's not a person in this world that will leave here without some form of suffering. That's what this world knows how to do is form sufferings. There probably no doubt, I know there's some here tonight who are going through the deep waters of suffering. Uh, some I know, some I may not know. Uh, but the book of First Peter gives us Great details on how to go through those sufferings. In the first chapter, the Holy Ghost gives us our concentration during our sufferings. He tells them that they're to remember in verse 18 that they were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. He said, but with the precious blood of Christ. He's telling people who are running for their lives not to focus on their problems, not to focus on their sufferings, uh, but remember the sufferings of Christ. He said, because listen, if you and I look to a bloody cross and realize that those sufferings that Jesus took was because of our sins, then the sufferings of this world become nothing more uh, than an assignment for this life. In chapter 2, he tells the suffering saints, uh, their conduct during their suffering. You're not going to believe this, but the Lord expects the same conduct out of those who are going through the valley as those who are not in the valley. He expects us to live the Christian life uh, according to the example of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's amazing to me how that when we go through the valleys of life, we somehow come up with the idea that we have a right to become rude and crude and short. Uh, but in chapter 2, he tells Peter to remind that crowd that he expects the same from those as he does those who are not suffering. In chapters 3 and 4, he tells them their correction during their suffering. He tells them that even though they're suffering, if they get out of line, he said that judgment will begin at the house of God. He said that's where it's going to start. He, he said if you start messing around, he said I'm going to whoop you because I love you. That's what he said. He said even though you're suffering, it will not stop my hand. Because you do know that not all suffering comes from God. Amen. I've got a few of Job's friends. They have my email. And they think every time I get a flat tire or my pipes freeze, the, de the Lord's uh, getting after me. But you know, when they got trouble, it's always the devil. You got any of those friends? Uh, I think they've jumped out of the book of Job. I've got an adversary who doesn't like me. He tries his dead level best to try to stop me from doing what the Lord wants me to do. And you do too. But in chapter 5, we have the cisterns or the wells that we're to drink from during our sufferings. I've read to us tonight chapter 5. And chapter 5 is no doubt an assignment list. He starts out and begins to talk to those people who have authority in the church. He starts off with the elders of the church. He tells them that they're to feed the flock of God. And listen, if you've ever tried to do that, it is not the easiest thing to do. Uh, to go into a study and to sit down and get God's mind and unveil the scriptures is something that must take a call and no doubt uh, an unveiling of the Holy Ghost. Uh, this book is a spirit. Spiritual book. Uh, someone told me, Brother Jones, when are you going to finally get a real job? I tell them all the time what I'm doing is a job. Because 1 Timothy says this, If a man desires the office of a bishop, 
He desireth a good work. And I suppose if God calls studying the Scripture work, then that's exactly what it is, work. Uh, that's, I guess I'm doing a real job. Uh, but he tells them not only to feed the flock of God, he begins to then pick at the other ones. He begins to talk to a younger generation. He says there in verse 5, Submit yourselves unto the elders. Now remember, this is written according to verse 1 in chapter 1 to folks who are running for their lives. They've been pushed out of society. He says, you submit yourselves one to another. That's tough. Nothing worse than trying to submit yourself to a grouchy old Baptist member. Do I got a witness? And don't say amen if you're close, but you know what I'm talking about. He gives them another assignment. Then he goes on there in verse 6 and says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That sometimes is extremely difficult when the God's hand is pushing you on those shores of service or pushing you to be pushed into a vessel that's going to go through a storm. But here's another sign that I mean it's almost like instead of lifting the burden off of these suffering saints, he begins to load up their wagon, feed the flock of God, submit yourselves. I mean it's the opposite of what we expect when someone's going through difficulties. He tells them in verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I've seen that stitched on pillows, spray painted on walls, unfortunately even tattooed on the back of someone's neck. Cast all your cares like it's not an assignment. But I'll promise you, that'll be the hardest thing we do in this world. Because he said, cast all your cares upon him. If you're anything like me, and I hope not, uh, but if you're anything like me, I only cast the stuff that I can't handle on him. But it doesn't say cast the stuff that you can't handle on him. He said put it all on him. And I'll promise you this, you won't leave with the wagon squeaking any tires of this building if you take that verse literally. He said everything you got to put on God. And that, my friend, is a lot of work. You won't ever stop praying. You ain't got to worry about how long your prayer closet is. You'll be singing sweet 24-hour prayer. Because you put it all on him, it's a chore. There he goes. And if all of that's not enough, look in verse 8. He tells them some more good news. Now, I've got to borrow your imagination. These folks, according to chapter 1 and verse 1, are scattered. They're not welcomed anywhere. They can't find a resting place. They can't find one place to settle in because every time they get comfortable, society pushes them out. Then on top of all of that, he says, do this. And then he says, watch out. He said, be sober. That means to be serious. He said to be vigilant. He said, because the adversary of the devil is walking about. Now, I don't know how you feel about this. But you talk, I'm, I would have been, if I'd have been Peter, you sure you got the right message? I mean, these folks are having a tough enough time, and now you've told them to do all of this and do all of this, and now you've got to tell them that we've got an adversary, the devil, who's sneaking around every corner, trying to trip them up. He's trying to devour them. I'm going to tell you, it's all bad news till God butts in. He says, well, just wait a minute. He said, I, I've got some good news for you. He said in verse 10, He gills them their cisterns. He said, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. He said, after that you have suffered a while, he said, he'll make you perfect. He said, he'll establish you and strengthen you and settle you. I like that phrase, the God of all grace. We could say it like this without being a Bible corrector. He's the God of every kind of grace. Oh, I knew it'd get quiet there. Uh, But I promise you this. Jesus didn't take our class uh, there over there to Bible college about him being just the God of one grace. uh, Because he said right here, preacher, he is the God of all grace. Uh, He declares that he has got more uh, grace than you and I can ever handle. I'm preaching tonight with God's help on the cisterns for the suffering saints. Uh, It is the God of all grace. He is 
the God of all grace tonight. Uh, I'm going to tell you, grace is defined like this. I've wrote it down. God's unmerited favor. Favor. Who in the world tonight in this church would not want a dose of God's favor? We could say it like this tonight. He's the God of all favor. He's the God of all grace. He is the God that's got everything you're looking for in this life. I want to say, number one, tonight he is the God of saving grace. Uh, these couple of days that we've been here in this church, uh, we've watched that saving grace fall on a 24-year-old young man uh, who had no idea his world was fixing to be turned around one Sunday morning when the Holy Ghost showed up uh, and unveiled the scriptures and called his name. Uh, saving grace. Uh, saving grace is the favor of God. That takes an undeserving sinner's whose life is stained with dirty living and washes them clean in His blood. That is the God of saving grace. I want to say this, saving grace calls. I told you the other day that I don't believe in a whensoever salvation. I don't believe someday you just go diving along and say, you know what, uh, I think today I'll get saved. Oh, no, you're not going to read that in this book. Uh, saving grace has a call to it. Uh, the God of glory must come to where you're at uh, and pull your name out uh, and unscale your eyes uh, and show you you're a sinner. Uh, it's all God's saving grace that starts it out. In fact, I quoted it to yesterday. John said, uh, he said this, no man can come except the Father draw that man. Now you're looking at an old-fashioned Baptist preacher that believes every man that's and woman, boy and girl, that's ever been born of a woman on this side of planet Earth uh, will have a time and a place where God will call their name. I'm a whosoever will. I'm not a whensoever will. It's all God. God's saving grace calls. You think about this. It was God's calling grace that called out to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the wee little man who climbed up in that sycamore tree. And the Bible says that Jesus passed by and said, Zacchaeus, get down from there. He said, I'm going to your house. You think about Matthew. Matthew was sitting there at the receipt of customs taking taxes. And Jesus walked by Matthew's table and he called out to Matthew and said, Matthew, if you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Let's talk about the apostle Paul who was once Saul, was going down that Damascus road and a voice from heaven called out to Paul and said, why are you persecuting me? You say, preacher, what are you saying? God's saving grace calls us out. Now, I don't know how they do it in Cincinnati, Ohio, but to think tonight that the creator of this universe called out my name and showed me I was a sinner and saved my ever-dying soul puts a spring in my step, uh, puts a shout down in my soul, uh, gives me a song in the darkest nights. Uh, I say glory to his name tonight. Glory to his name. Uh, I didn't deserve one thing, uh, but God looked down. Saving grace calls. Saving grace convicts. You don't hear much of this anymore, but I'll promise you this. If God ever overshadows us and unveils our sin of who we really are, you won't be popping bubble gum on the way to the altar. You'll be like those. Uh, I remember the day he showed me where I was. Uh, I wasn't chewing bubble gum and popping bubbles and singing, Mary had a little lamb when I come down there. I was weeping and crying and telling God, I'm sorry. And I wasn't even in the church house. Uh, I was sitting on some some dead end street in the middle of the yard uh, trying to mow grass but John 3 16 got real big in my heart uh, and God said you friend uh, were the reason I had to die on an old rugged cross because you're a liar and you're a sinner and buddy I fell down there there wasn't a just as I am playing uh, there wasn't a deacon doing nothing the God of the universe stepped down there kneeled down and said I'll save you if you say yes uh, and I was just real smart and said you can't beat that deal I took he took my sin I took his grace 
He's the God of saving grace. That saving grace calls. That saving grace convicts. You say, I ain't never been there. Never had no, no conviction. Well, you probably ain't never been there then. And you probably need to get there. If I could, if I could work it up, I'd work it up. Oh, I've shamed plenty of them. Down through the ages, boy, I've shamed them all. But I've realized this. You ain't got to shame nobody. Uh, once God gets in there and begins to speak truth to their ears, uh, I don't have to convince them they're a sinner, buddy. By the time they get there and you read to them Romans 3, they're looking at you in total agreement. Uh, I pastored their little country church in the middle of nowhere. And I'm going to tell you, we had some rough. I preached the third Sunday in the county jail. And I preached just like this. We, I preached in the morning, and then I preached four sermons in jail. I'm going to tell you right now, buddy, we had a lively crowd there at the jailhouse. And I'm not one of those. You ain't going to repeat after me. I'm not going to give you some little giddy. I'm not against that, but I just don't do it. And I said, if you'd like to be saved, you're going to have to come down here and tell God in your own words what it is that you... And they, they'd come one by one. I'm talking crooks. I'm talking about some rough street folks uh, up there. I mean, drug addicts and, and harlots. I mean, and they'd come. I pastored the first Baptist church. Woo! I mean, doesn't that sound fancy? I mean, we'd get folks from Florida that would come up there, and they'd think they was entering in one of them fancy pants. And, buddy, there was nothing fancy about us. Once the choir started singing and people started shouting and people began to raise their hands, they realized one thing. They did not enter into the first Baptist church, but the first crazy Baptist church uh, that ain't got over being saved. But I remember this one gal. She had four kids from four different people. God bless her heart. She was raised. She didn't know a thing, thimbleful about God. But I remember I preached out of that passage in Corinthians, such were some of you. I'm going to tell you, that's the first time she was wearing a miniskirt, a jean miniskirt. Brother, I'm telling you, when she walked through the door, I didn't know who she was. She heard about us through the jail ministry. And I thought, Lord, please help us. And she didn't sit in the back. Oh, no. She walked straight down, sat right in the second row, I'm going to tell you, them kids were climbing all over the place. But I tell you, I preached and such were some of you. And when I said amen to that last prayer closing message, I looked up and there she stood with all them kids running around there and those hot, salty tears uh, rolling down her face. Uh, And I said, what did you come for? She said, I need that. Uh, She said, I'm a sinner. Uh, You say, what was that? That was that convicting, saving grace of God. Uh, I want to say on testimony tonight, Thank God for convicting grace. Thank God for that saving grace that convicted me enough to call on a Savior. I tell you, there's, He's not only the God of saving grace, but He is the God of serving grace. I'm going to tell you, anybody that's ever preached a message, ever sang a song, ever taught a Sunday school lesson, knows what I'm talking about Remember, grace is the favor of God. I remember listening to two fellas talking about their ministries. One, they was both colored fellas, and the one fella had a degree. He had more letters after his name, buddy, than he could preach. Boy, he could preach. And the other fella didn't have a lick education. He got saved in some uh, uh, halfway house, you know, where they put people up who are homeless. And boy, they was in a storefront building, and that place was booming. They were seeing souls saved. They was packing that storefront building out. Every Sunday, that other fella couldn't get a thimble full of people in there. And the people that did come was as dry and as, and as, and as, uh, as laid back as you could get. To, and they was talking back and forth about their ministries. And that storefront preacher was bragging about what God was doing. And that other fella said, what, what do you got going on? He said, man, we got padded pews, we got steeples, we got it all, brother. I mean, he said, I've just finished my course in this disp. I mean, he just began to tell all of his degrees. And that black guy said, I don't know nothing about all that. He said, but we got God. He said, and boy, when I get up there, he said, I could be preaching and mumbling and jumbling. He said, but all of a sudden, he said, folks are getting saved and folks are getting happy. You say, what is that? That's that serving grace. That's that favor of God that falls down on some singer. Boy, we've heard all kinds of singers. 
Oh, man, we've seen the ones that hold the mics just right. Oh, I've watched them. Boy, they, they know just all those, how to hold it out long. And, but I've seen them country folks, amen. They get up and just let it go. And God seems to smile down on that. You say, what is that? That's that favor. You know what? Hey, I don't know what unction is. I really don't. But I know what it ain't. It ain't an education. It ain't a suit and tie. It ain't fancy shoes. Uh, I'm going to tell you, we've got a generation of young preachers now. If they'd spend more time worried about the Holy Ghost and the favor of God as they do on their outfits, uh, we'd start seeing some action. But they're more worried about ties and matching their Bibles and shiny shoes. My Lord, I've got most of my ties are given to me. But I walk into a meeting and I get them young preachers, they want to flip my tie over. And they'll say, oh, wow, that's a good one. I said, is that a good one? Yeah, that's a good one. They'll name off some brand name. I said, well, can you quote me a verse? A what? I mean, you know every brand name of suit and tie and shoes, but you couldn't quote a verse. And then we wonder why we're in the... I'm telling you, it takes God's favor. I beg for God's power. I used to beg for God's power so I didn't look stupid. Now it don't matter. I'm doing a pretty good job of looking stupid, but now I pray for God's favor because souls need to be saved. Saints need to help. And I'm going to tell you, churches need the God of all grace to pour it out. Let me tell you what the Apostle Paul said, and I'm hastening. He said this in the Galatians chapter 1, in verse 15. He said, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen. Paul testified to the Galatians, it was God's grace that called Him. You're looking at a Baptist preacher that believes in a call on a man's life. Uh, I can take you to the place where God saved me, and I can take you to the place that God called me. Don't try this without a call. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of folks trying to do it without a call, and it hurts. I tell you, he told this to the church at Corinth. He said, for I am the least among the apostles because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul told the church of Galatians it was God's grace that gave him the ability to preach the power of God. Uh, He told the church of Corinth uh, it was the grace of God that gave him the power to preach. I'm going to tell you that's serving grace. I'm going to tell you tonight, not only do we need God's serving grace to be the preacher, but we need him to be the mother and the father that we need to be. We've elevated positions that men look at, uh, preaching and singing. But I'm going to tell you, church, there's a whole lot more important positions in this world than just preaching and singing. My Lord, if we don't have Holy Ghost mothers uh, raising children in the power and in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost, this whole world is going to go to hell in a handbasket uh, if we don't have some men uh, who will rule their home in the power and in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we'll have our families destroyed. You say, what's it take? preacher the God of all grace giving you that favor it takes God's grace to be a dad it takes God's grace to be a nursery uh, worker it takes God's grace to be a Sunday school teacher I'm going to tell you don't you dare go into a Sunday school room without finding a quiet place and begging for the power of God this new generation this new fedangle they make fun of it they think it's funny they always say things like, you know, well, what if that ain't... I had one fellow recently said, well, what if that ain't never happened to me? I said, well, get out of the ministry. Amen. I said, if you ain't never had that, he said, well, that's just, that's just feelings. I said, oh, no, that's the real deal. If you're not full of the Holy Ghost, just hush. Don't say a word. You're just going to waste a lot of people's time. You're going to waste a lot of people's time. They're making fun of it. But I'll promise you this. If you're looking for it, 
Those leaves uh, will rustle on that tree, neighbor. Uh, God will send a breeze down in a quiet place uh, and mothers can feel it and fathers can feel it and teenagers can feel it. Uh, I'm going to tell you, He's the God of serving grace. He'll help you. Serving grace commissions men. Titles are given by men. You ever hear those guys have to tell everybody every five minutes, I'm a man of God. I don't know if they're trying to convince us or them. But I'm going to tell you, you ain't got to walk around telling everybody you're a man of God. You'll know what God gives you because He'll give you some assignments. You ain't got to walk around telling everybody you're full of the Holy Ghost. They'll know you've been with God. Teenager, you ain't going to walk them school hallways and people are not going to say, that person's different. Those people are real Christians. If you're acting like everybody else, they'll see a difference. Moses' face shone like the sun. He spent a little time. Those disciples, they said, we perceived that these men had been with Jesus. It takes serving grace. I say this tonight. He's not only the God of saving grace and serving grace. He's the God of suffering grace. I will not stand up here tonight and pretend to know why Christians suffer. I won't get up here and tell you why. I can't explain to us tonight. I wish I could. I've searched the scriptures. I wish I could get up here and tell you that God showed me why we suffer. And I know we're living in a wicked world. But some of the most godliest people I know have gone through the most difficult things in this world. I pastored some. Their son got a call to preach. He worked at an iron mill where they stamped iron lids for manhole covers. And boy, he was called to preach. He loved the Lord, had a sweet family. One day he was working on those machines and someone didn't turn the breaker off to it, hit the button, and pushed him up into that thing and killed him. They found that boy stuck to the ceiling. And yet Sunday morning they'd come in through that auditorium and sit down and sing glory to God. Then the little months later, their oldest daughter began to get sick, began to take ill, and they couldn't figure it out. They went and done some tests, found out she had cancer of the blood. It wasn't long months after that, she passed away. Sunday morning, they'd come to the doors of the church, singing amazing grace, how sweet the sound you know, in those few years I pastored, Preacher Bill, I've watched a lot of folks go through some heavy water. I've watched a lot of folks carry a lot of burdens. Uh, and I've watched some when they get to that valley, that valley of Baca, I've watched them turn their backs on God, walk out. You've went and visited them. And they say, I don't want nothing to do with it. I'm done. It didn't turn out the way I hoped it would turn out. Uh, but then I've watched some go through it, singing, it is well with my soul. You say, what's the difference, preacher? I can't tell you why we suffer, but I can tell us how we're going to make it through the sufferings of this world. It is the God of all grace uh, granting us uh, the power to go through those things, still singing those songs. Uh, it'll be God that gives us the favor to help us along through this world, uh, and it gives us the strength to make it one more day. The Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth this in chapter 12. He said, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, he said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. He said, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is what Paul said. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The apostle Paul said this, I found out something. When I'm suffering, 
I experienced something so supernatural that I can't explain to you other than the fact that God rests His strength in my body. So many Christians pray, God, don't let me suffer. Lord, don't let me go through. And they never experience that suffering grace. They go through this world begging God to keep them from something that is more what Paul called a blessing. He said, first, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. He said, God gave me this. And then he said, I'm going to glory in it. He said, I'm going I'm to rejoice in my necessities. I'll be honest with you now. I've been preaching over 20 years. I ain't never heard anybody get up in a testimony service and say, I just want to thank God I ain't got two nickels to rub together. I've never heard anybody do that. Maybe they do that here. I've never heard anybody get up in a church service and say, I want to thank God I, 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 had, I take that back. We had not far from here. We was so close to Horse Cave. Fellow come into the revival meeting. He was living under a viaduct. He did come in there. God touched him that night. The next night he stood up and said, I thank God. I take that back. I, I'm sorry. The Lord just reminded me. He stood up and said, I thank God I was living underneath this viaduct. I lost my home. He said, so I could have heard that message. It's going to help me down the road. That's what he said. So I have heard some, but I ain't never heard anybody other than that fellow get up and say, I thank God for my necessities. I ain't never heard anybody get up and say, well, I thank God for cancer. I'm glad I'm suffering down here. with." I ain't never heard anybody do that. But Paul said, I thank God. I rejoice. He testifies. He raised his hands. I thank God. He said, because it's in my weakness that I feel that grace, that favor fall on me. If you've ever read the history of the Christians as they suffered, burned at the stakes, cut their tongues out, lit on fire to line, line the pathways for the, the leaders of the Roman leaders of the day. I've heard people say, well, they must have been tough. No, they weren't tough. They got a hold of the power of God. That they could be burned at the stake and sing amazing grace. They had the power of God resting on them. So whatever they were going through, they could feel that God of suffering grace. He said this, he's the God of suffering grace. He's the God of standing grace. We're ever living in a day and hour where we need some standing grace. It's today. I'm talking about good Bible salvation living, Bible living, standing grace. I tell you, we're living in a day where we're walking off the side of the hill. The pressures of convenience and crowds are getting us to push back from the old values of the Bible. And I'll tell you what we need tonight is some good standing grace. I say this tonight, there's smiling grace. I'm glad God can still take and paint a smile on a Christian's face. There's a young lady in this church, I'm telling you. If I, I can't remember her name for the life of me, but it'll come to me about 2 o'clock. You know what I like? I like to watch that gal smile. Amen. She's painted them, them hallway up there. I like to see young people. You ever see some of them? I'm not, I'm not kidding. You go to some Baptist churches and you wonder if you really want to come back. I mean, they look at the ground, they act like everything's a mully grub. They, their bottom lip is dragging the ground. You're thinking, if that's what it is, I don't want that. Uh, I'm going to tell you what we need tonight is some smiling grace. Uh, God needs to paint a smile back on your face. You ever been to one of them churches, the madder you are, the more spiritual you are? I can't stand We go to them places once in a while. I just go back to the motorhome as fast as I can. I mean, if you ain't mad about something, you ain't about I mean, it just drives me crazy. They're soaring grace, smiling grace, singing grace. My soul, the talent in this church building is amazing. But I've watched folks who can sing, sing the glory of God in a service, and they ain't got no song no more. The world and the devil and the trials have wiped it right off their face. You know it would be good tonight? If we'd get some of that back. You know what he said? He said he's the God of all grace. There's stuff that I couldn't even tell you. He's everything you can think of. He's got it. He's got it tonight. I say this. James 4, 6. But God giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud. I like the word resisteth because it's an NFL term. Stiff on. 
That's what it is. He said, I stiff arm the proud. People that won't come humbly before. He said, I, I stiff arm them. He said, but I give grace to the humble. The kids are going to come sing a song of invitation. And while they're coming, I want to give you a story and I'm done. I read about a fellow by the name of Alexander the Great. I'm sure you've heard of him. Alexander the Great, that great leader, had, an, had a person, that, an advisor that he would go to. And this advisor helped him so much. This is what he said. He said, you can ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. Boy, and that advisor began to think, man, I, anything, anything. So he got to thinking and went over there and grabbed a pencil and paper and wrote down a large amount of money. A large amount of money. Had a lot of zeros behind it. Tore that off, walked over. Mr. Alexander's financial man stood there and he handed it to him. And that guy looked down there and saw that piece of paper and said, I will not give you this. That is appalling. You should be ashamed of yourself to ask for something that large. The fellow said he did say anything. He said, I'm not giving you nothing until I speak to Mr. Alexander. So that guy walked in there, Mr. Alexander's office, walked up to Mr. Alexander and said, this is what he asked for. He had the audacity to ask for this and he put it on his table. Mr. Alexander opened that piece of paper up, saw all them zeros smile come across his face this is what was written down they said Mr. Alexander said this he said that's a lot to ask for but not a lot for Alexander to give he said we have it give it to him I was wondering this is a good Bible church could you help me finish your verse you have not because you I'm wondering tonight, is there some grace that you need? Is there some favor that you need to get from God? Because I was just saying, He resisteth the proud, but He giveth grace to the humble. And y'all said, you have not because you ask not. Maybe tonight what you need is that saving grace. God's calling you out. He's convicting your heart. And you'd say, I want that. I need that saving grace. You come get it. Free of charge, already been paid for. Maybe you're here tonight and you know the smile on your face has been wiped off by this world. You used to smile. You used to be happy. The disappointments have wiped it off. It'd be good for you to say, Lord, I need some of that smile and grace. Maybe you're here tonight and you need some of that serving grace. You've been working in the nursery. You've been doing your motherly duties and fatherly duties. And you need some of that good old-fashioned serving grace. Well, I'll promise you this. When you come, he's got it. We're going to stand to our feet. I'm here to stand to help.